Rolf Neslin vanished sometime in August of 1980 from Lopez Island in Washington, where he lived with his wife, Ruth Nesland. Their marriage was fraught with heavy drinking and violent altercations, which often led to injuries and property damage. Police had been called to their home on multiple occasions to intervene in these fights, with Rolf typically sustaining the injuries. In February of 1981, Rolf's friends became concerned for his well-being since they hadn't heard from him in months and asked the police to check on him. When investigators visited his residence, Ruth informed them that Rolf had left her on August the 14th of 1980, and the last time anyone saw him, aside from her, was on August the 5th. She believed that he ran away with his ex-girlfriend, Eleanor. Rolf had two adult children with Eleanor, and the two remained friends after their relationship had ended. Ruth suspected that Rolf was involved with Eleanor and speculated that they had gone to Norway, his birthplace. Ruth claimed to have gone to Norway in October of 1980 searching for Rolf. However, however, this was later found out to be a lie. Eleanor did indeed travel to Norway in 1980, but it wasn't with Rolf. she gotten married and went on her honeymoon with a new husband. Ruth maintained that Rolf had packed up his bags and driven away, which, was, which his car was later found abandoned in the city of Anna Cortez at a ferry dock. However, there was no clear signs of foul play at the scene. And investigators couldn't determine who had driven his car to the dock. Authorities were suspicious of Ruth's account and doubted that Rolf had left voluntarily. He left behind all of his belongings, including clothing, jewelry, money, medication, and cars. He had also not renewed his prescriptions with his doctor, and he hadn't contacted friends or relatives since his disappearance, which is very out of character. Ralph usually sent out Christmas cards to his loved ones every year, but no one received a card from him in 1980 or in the years late after. He also had funds in American and Norwegian banks, but had made no attempts to access the money since August of 1980. Notably, shortly after his disappearance, Ruth put several of his belongings, including two cars, up for sale. In December of 1981, she was declared the trustee of Rolf's estate during his absence against the objections of his children. She transformed their home into a popular bed and breakfast called the Alec Bay Inn. Prior to his disappearance, Rolf was a ship, was a ship captain and also well, very well known in the Seattle area. He immigrated to the U.S. as a teenager, gained citizenship, and continued to visit Norway regularly, maintaining close ties with his family there. In 1978, Rolf was involved in a significant shipping accident while captaining the ship Chavez, which crashed into the West Seattle Bridge support pillars, causing much destruction. Although nobody died, the incident tarnished his reputation, leading to his retirement. He received a monthly pension of $1,800 from the Puget Sound Captains Association. Shortly before vanishing, Rolf discovered that Ruth, who held power of attorney and managed their finances, had withdrawn nearly $80,000 from their joint bank accounts and moved it into accounts solely in her name. She also falsely claimed that loans they had extended to friends and acquaintances remained unpaid when, in fact, they were settled many years prior. Rolf was outraged by these discoveries and intended to revoke Ruth's power of attorney and change his will to exclude her, naming his sons as his sole beneficiaries. He even expressed fears that Ruth might be poisoning him and asked Eleanor to ensure his body would undergo an autopsy had he died. In April of 1981, police searched the Nestlin home for evidence but found very little. However, some of Ruth's relatives informed investigators that they had often heard her threaten to kill Rolf. Although these statements were typically made while she was drunk and had not where they were not taken seriously until Rolf's disappearance. 
1982, Ruth's brother Paul Myers came forward and claimed that Ruth confessed to murdering Rolf. According to her alleged confession to her brother Robert, who was present when Rolf was killed, Robert held Rolf while Ruth shot him twice. Subsequently, Robert helped helped her dispose of the body, and they put the body from there in a barrel and discarded the ashes in a manure pile. Based on these statements, authorities obtained a second search warrant of the Nesland home. It was discovered that Ruth had replaced sections of the carpet, and when it was cut away, bloodstains were visible on the padding and floor beneath it. Blood was also found on the ceiling of one of the rooms, as well as the hallway outside. The amount of blood indicated a severe injury or fatality with high-velocity splatter on the ceiling, typically associated with gunshot wounds. There was additional blood evidence on the shower doors in the master bathroom. Although DNA evidence was not available at the time, investigators established the blood was human and matched type A, which both Rolf and Ruth had. Several firearms were discovered in the residence, including a 38 caliber Smith & Wesson revolver found in Ruth's dresser, which had bloodstains on it. In March of 1983, Ruth was charged with first-degree murder in connection with Rolf's disappearance. The legal proceedings experienced numerous delays, partly due to Ruth's health issues, including high blood pressure and an episode of delirium tremors. Her trial didn't take place until October of 1985. The prosecution argued that Rolf confronted Ruth about the stolen money, prompting her and her brother Robert to shoot him and dispose of him. Robert, suffering from advanced dementia in 1985, lived in a nursing home and never faced charges for his involvement. Several friends and relatives of Ruth testified that she had made statements about killing Rolf after he disappeared, but due to her consistent state of being drunk, no one took these statements seriously. The defense suggested that Rolf had left voluntarily, possibly to Norway, or that he'd taken his own life due to despair over the West Seattle Bridge accident and the end of his career. Ruth's defense attorney contended that the bloodstains in their home were insufficient evidence of murder and could have resulted from various accidents during home improvements. Ruth's nosebleeds or frequent fights between the couple leading to, the, to Ralph's disappearance. Ultimately, the jury found Ruth guilty of first-degree murder, and she was sentenced to 20 years to life in prison. She was initially released on bail pending her appeal, but was subsequently ordered to begin serving her sentence after causing a car accident while driving under the influence, severely injuring two bicyclists. Ruth passed away in prison in 1993 at the age of 73, seven years into her sentence. Her health had become fragile, and she was diagnosed with lung cancer in 1992. Authorities had considered granting her early release due to her medical issues, but she passed away before a formal hearing could be held by the Board of Clemency and Pardons. She maintained her innocence in Ralph's case till the end. Ralph's body has never been found, marking the first instance in Washington state history where a defendant was convicted of murder without the body. Anne Rule, renowned true crime writer, featured the Neslin case in her 2000 book, No Regrets and Other True Cases. Additionally, blood spatter expert Rod Engler discussed the case in his 2010 memoir, Blood Secrets, Chronicles of a Crime Scene Reconstruction List. Christina White went missing on April the 28th, 1979, during the Asseton County Fair in Asseton, Washington. The last contact with her occurred at 2.30 p.m., when she called her mom from a friend's house, stating that she didn't feel good due to the heat. 
Her mother, unable to come pick her up, advised her to rest with a wet towel on her neck and to return home when she felt better. However, Christina never came, never called back, and her mother ass assumed that she would felt better and went back to the fair. Sometime between 7 and 10 p.m., Christina was last seen on 2nd Street. When her mother went to go get her, Christina was nowhere to be found. Her classmates mentioned that she had been heading home when they last saw her. Several weeks prior, Christina's school papers were discovered scattered on a farm on the outskirts of Aceton. Christina was riding her new white 10-speed bike at the time she vanished, which had been a distinct which had a distinctive front basket and 3-inch wing nuts on the front wheels. Possibly it was a Schwinn. This bike had been a birthday present just eight weeks before her disappearance, and it has never been located. At the time Christina resided with her mom and stepdad, she attended a local Lutheran church and had various summer plans, including camping trips, baseball, and going to visit with her father for a month. Authorities don't believe, however, that she left voluntary, von, voluntarily. Law enforcement suspects a potential connection between Christina's case and the 1982 disappearance of Stephen Pearsall, as well as the murders of Christina Nelson, Brandy Miller, and Kristen David. The first three mentioned all disappeared from Lewiston, Idaho on the same night in 1982. Now, what some think is with both Nelson and Miller being found in a canyon sometime in 1984. They speculate Pearsall may have witnessed the deaths of Nelson and Miller, and whomever was the killer came for him out of fear that he could possibly say something. Now, one very, very strange clue that's also out there is this individual who was involved with the Lewiston Civic Theater, who is believed to have also murdered the two sisters as well as the Idaho College student, was also, was also in Washington at the time that Christina White went missing, in the same location she would went missing. Now, this suspect, however, has never been publicly identified. Um... To my knowledge, I've seen some true crime blogs mention this name um, due to the fact he's never publicly been named, though I don't want to say anything. I'll definitely give you the freedom to check that out for yourself. And like this case and the disappearance of Stephen Pearsall, both still to this day remain unsolved. Robert Weichel, a retired sheet metal worker from King County, Washington, went missing on February 21st, 1996. He left home with the intention of purchasing a 1961 Ford Thunderbird, but never reached his destination. Weichel had a passion for classic cars, often buying, restoring, and reselling them to supplement his income. Known to carry substantial amounts of money for these business transactions, he likely had as much as $5,000 on him the time he went missing. Weichel typically used public transportation when he made these trips to inspect and purchase the vehicles. On March the 11th of 1996, Weichel's 1989 Mercedes-Benz convertible coupe was found abandoned at a park and ride in, B in Berrien, Washington. Hope I said that right. And it was subsequently towed. Surprisingly, however, his wallet was inside the car, but had no cash inside. There was no sign of Weichel at the scene. Concerned about his unusual situation of his car being towed, a friend reported Weichel as a missing person to authorities on March 13th of 1996. It was very out of character for Weichel to leave his car unattended in a parking lot for a long period of time. He typically entrusted it to, his, to one of his friends when he would go on these trips. Investigations into his disappearance revealed that his home still contained luggage and clothing as well as rotting food all over his kitchen. 
In 2009, in the month of February, Myron Wynn, also known as Myron Holdridge, was arrested and charged with first-degree murder in connection with Weichel's case. Wynn, an acquaintance of Weichel, was the last known person to have seen him. He had informed Weichel about the Ford Thunderbird for sale, and the two went to inspect the car together. After Weichel's disappearance, Wynn moved to Texas, but was eventually apprehended there. Suspicion arose when, in 1996, Wynn presented his girlfriend a large diamond, claiming he found it in the parking lot where Weichel's car was later discovered. In 1999, police confiscated the stone from a relative of Wynn's, believing they had come from a ring that Weichel wore the day he vanished. The relative stated that she had gotten it from Wynn after he relocated to Texas. Authorities believed that Wynn had lured Weichel to a secluded location, where he then robbed and killed him. Wynn's defense attorney argued that the diamond they found wasn't Weichel's, and Weichel may have left of his own accord, potentially to Argentina, where he was supposedly planning a trip prior to his disappearance. After a mistrial was declared in December of 2010, due to the jury's inability to reach a verdict, Wynn was convicted in the second trial in April of 2011 and sentenced to 20 years in prison. Weichel was known for being very friendly and generous to those around him, often engaging in conversations with strangers. Described as as a very fresh and young and younger than his actual age, his family believed that he would have fought back if he'd been attacked or robbed, and any attack most likely probably came when he was turned away from whoever the perpetrator need be. He previously lived in Alaska and Illinois before relocating to Washington some years before he disappeared. Foul play is suspected in his case due to the circumstances that are involved. The next story we're going to be featuring today is going to be the tragic disappearance of Kiplin Davis, which took place in 1995. She was last seen at Spanish Fork High School in her hometown of Spanish Fork, Utah, on May the 2nd of 1995. She was a sophomore at the time of her disappearance. On this faithful day, Kiplin attended her early driver's ed class and her morning classes. She even got to have lunch with her friends. However, she didn't attend fourth and fifth period classes that day after she left lunch marking the last known time anyone had seen her in the school. There, were, there was potential but unconfirmed sightings of Kiplin in a vehicle on Main Street in Spanish Fork shortly after she left school. All of her belongings, including her purse, makeup, her retainer, as well as her school books, were left behind in her locker at school. Kiplin never returned home that day, and her family reported her missing when she failed to come home at 5 o'clock that night. Now, initially, Kiplin's disappearance was investigated to be a runaway case due to her age and an argument she'd had with her family about school shortly before she'd vanished. However, her parents and loved ones insisted this was very uncharacteristic of her to be leaving with no warning. Now, at the time she disappeared, she was looking forward to getting her driver's license, and her older sister was getting ready for her wedding. As months went, went on without any sign of Kiplin or clues to her whereabouts, authorities began to suspect foul play in her disappearance, and her family believed she may have been murdered. There were rumor, rumors circulating around the town that her body was buried in a local canyon, but no concrete evidence emerged to lead investigators to this location. It was in 2005 several in indictments were made in the connection of Kiplin's case. Scott Brunson, Gary Von Blackmore, Timmy, Timmy Olson, and Christopher Jepson, as well as David Leifson, were all charged with various offenses, from perjury to making false statements to law enforcement. 
Now, all these individuals were students at Spanish Fork High School at the time Kiplin had vanished, with some of them being members of the high school's drama club. They claimed to have been working on lighting for a school performance in the auditorium the day of her disappearance. However, none of the choir members who performed in the auditorium that day the same t- in the same time frame remembered seeing any of them. In the following years, plea deals and trials led to convictions, with some individuals pleading guilty to perjury, while others were convicted of various charges. Authorities believe that Kiplin had been led from school, raped, and murdered. They suspected the individuals who knew, who knew her had connections to the crime and covering it up. Timmy Brent Olson, in particular, played a significant role in Kiplin's case. He ultimately pled guilty to first-degree manslaughter, admitting he'd witnessed another person strike Kiplin twice in the head with a rock. However, he refused to reveal the identity of the accomplice or the location of Kiplin's body. Despite these developments, Kiplin Davis has never been located, and her disappearance remains unsolved. Foul play is strongly suspected due to the circumstances surrounding her disappearance. In 1982, an 18-year-old named Sherry Ierly worked as a pizza delivery driver for Domino's in in Salem, Oregon. Despite being relatively new to the job, she just graduated from Sprague High School and was living with her cousin in an apartment in Salem. On the 4th of July, 1982, Sherry's life took a tragic turn when she covered a colleague's shift on the 4th, setting stage for an unsolved mystery that remains unresolved into 2024. Around 9 p.m. that that evening, the restaurant received a call from a middle-aged man who referred to himself as Dunbar. During the call, he mentioned a previous pizza delivery by a woman in an orange Volkswagen, assuming she would know the address. However, this driver was not on duty that night, leading to a callback to the mysterious caller. The callback number led to the city center motel, but the man claimed he would be on River Haven Drive near Brown Island Road, a heavily wooded area near Wilmette River. Sherry went on on a ride in her Ford Pinto to that specific location, but never returned to Domino's. At 10 p.m., her car was found with the engine running, her hat and pizza boxes scattered around it. Some boxes had tire and boot prints, suggesting foul play in Sherry's abduction. Investigations focused on the caller, who provided a fake name and address. The next day, a ransom demand was made for Sherry's safe return, but the caller never followed up with the police or collected any money. Witnesses reported a suspicious older model truck parked near the scene, described as a four-wheel drive with large tires and two spotlights on top, but the truck and its driver remained unidentified. A month later, psychic investigator John Ketchings, awakened by a vision, received information about Sherry's case. He realized that the ghostly figure he saw was Sherry. He was compelled to assist in the case. Ketching had visions of Sherry's encounter with a pickup truck that night. During a visit to the abduction scene, he heard a list of possible suspects with with green pickup trucks, and one name stood out, Daryl Wilson. Wilson became a suspect later, and was revealed that he owned a lime green pickup truck that he had painted brown shortly after Sherry's disappearance. However, when questioned, he denied knowing Sherry. When investigators took Ketchings to Wilson's home, he saw the same house that he'd envisioned. Wilson refused a polygraph, but agreed to speak with Ketchings, claiming he was camping on the night of Sherry's abduction. However, many discrepancies in his story came about, coming off very suspicious. Tragically, Wilson committed suicide shortly after the encounter with Ketchings, and the case went cold. 
Cold case investigators later revisited the case and found that Wilson didn't fit the profile of the abductor. They believed Sherry's kidnapper may have committed similar crimes. A year after Sherry's disappearance, Katie Redmond suffered a similar fate, and her killer, William Scott Smith, was convicted. Smith was initially initially denied any involvement in Sherry's case, but was later found to have been near the scene on the night of her disappearance. In 2007, Smith confessed his involvement in Sherry's abduction and murder, implicating his friend Roger Nosef. They ordered pizza to lure Sherry, grabbed her when she arrived, and strangled her near Smith's parents' home before disposing of her body in the Pudding River. Smith's confession matched physical evidence and revealed details about the case previously unknown to the public. Nosef had also made a ransom call to Domino's demanding $50,000 for Sherry's return. Despite these developments, Sherry's body has never been found. She was 5 feet 2 inches and around 100 pounds with brown hair, blue eyes, and a tattoo of TB between her left thumb and forefinger. On the night of her disappearance, she was wearing a red, white, and blue Domino's pizza shirt and blue jeans. Today, Sherry would be 60 years old, but the mystery of her disappearance remains haunting and unsolved. Kelly Brannon and her boyfriend, Eddie Emerson, were staying at the Sunshine Inn Hotel in Live Oak, Florida in July of 2020. They were on their way from McCanopy, Florida, to Detroit, Michigan, in separate vehicles. They were carrying their belongings, a dog, and eight chickens. Their plan was to buy a house and settle in Detroit. Unfortunately, Emerson's truck broke down on July the 9th, leading them to stay at the hotel while awaiting repairs. On the night of July the 14th and 15th, an argument occurred between Brandon and Emerson. Following the dispute, Brandon left the hotel room, but maintained contact with Emerson through text messages. At 10.30 p.m., Emerson went outside to check on her and found her drunk and upset. Concerned for her safety, he took her car keys to prevent her from driving under the influence. Around midnight, Brannon sent a text to Emerson expressing her intention to leave him. She also mentioned taking her car registration, a bag of clothes, and her guitar. Emerson suggested she come back inside and get some rest, but she decided not to and proceeded to leave. Just before 1 a.m., Brannon left a voicemail with Emerson, indicating that she had got another hotel room by herself and was threatening to leave him for Detroit or even Iceland. In the midst of her message, she suddenly mentioned getting into a car, and the call ended abruptly. Witnesses reported seeing Brannon leaving the hotel with her guitar around the same time she left the voicemail. Tragically, Kelly Brannon has not been seen or heard from since this night. Her purse, money, ID, and personal items were found inside her unlocked car at the hotel, but her phone and guitar were missing. Her phone has remained turned off since her disappearance and without a charger. It couldn't have been used. Her guitar, a left-handed Fender Stratocaster with a sanded-off headstock logo, has never been recovered. Given their tumultuous relationship and the history of domestic violence, Emerson was regarded as a person of interest in Brandon's disappearance. However, he's been cooperative with the authorities and an investigation and maintains that he never harmed her that evening, expressing uncertainty about her whereabouts. Brandon, known for her frequent travels and connections across the country, always kept in touch with her mother in New Hampshire. Her prolonged silence has raised concerns among her family and Emerson, who fear for her well-being. To this day, Kelly Brannon's disappearance remains unresolved. Jamie Shear was a young woman loved by many, from her family, friends, to even her co-workers at an up-and-coming software company you may know by the name of Microsoft, Jamie was very popular and well-liked. 
However, many things changed in the year 1990. At the time of her disappearance, Jamie was married to Stephen Frank Shear, and they had a young son together. Their marriage was very troubled, and Jamie had decided to seek divorce in the autumn of 1990. On the evening of September 29, 1990, Jamie left the residence in Redmond, Washington, and spent that night at her parents' house with her son. The next morning, she agreed to meet with Stephen after he pleaded with her to reconsider the divorce during a phone call. Jamie left their child with her parents and drove to meet with him on September the 30th. Jamie called her mom around 8.30 a.m. and mentioned that Stephen had grabbed her purse and run off. She assumed he was heading back to their residence, intending to meet him there to get it, as well as her other belongings. Later on, at approximately 11.45, however, Jamie called her parents again and informed them that Stephen had, was indeed at their home. She planned to stop at a local fast food restaurant called Taco Time to buy lunch before going back to her parents' house. Sadly, she never made it there, and this was her last phone call. Her mother noted that Jamie didn't seem distressed at the time of their conversation. Stephen called Jamie's parents about 30 minutes later, followed by 15 minutes later, asking if, and if, asking if they'd heard or seen Jamie. Jamie's mother found this very odd, as Stephen typically made frequent phone calls to check in on her and was very possessive of her. Concern grew when Stephen failed to call until 6 p.m., which was highly unusual for him. He informed Jamie's family that he couldn't bring himself to return to their home and asked to stay with his son at her parents' house for the next week. Several days after her disappearance, Jamie's gray 1980 Mazda RX-7 was found abandoned at a Shoreline Washington Church parking lot. Her purse was missing from the vehicle, but her suitcase remained inside with clothing. Although her underwear was missing, no trace of Jamie was found at the scene. Stephen immediately became a prime suspect in Jamie's disappearance due to his odd behavior. He started dating another woman shortly after and frequently wore Jamie's underwear. You did not hear that wrong. He frequently wore Jamie's underwear. As well as he tied them to his arm, and he would also wear them as a necklace, claiming it helped him feel closer to her. Stephen also made false claims about Jamie's fate, saying that she died in a car accident to some, and he also told others that she had fallen victim to the Green River Killer, which, as we obviously know, she was not in a car accident. And Gary Ridgway, who we now know as the Green River Killer, generally liked to seek working women at the time of his disappearances, whereas, like I said, a young HR rep for Microsoft, who was fairly successful at the time, who also had a large chunk of very early Microsoft shares that to this day, I believe, from one estimate I read, they would be worth roughly over $5 million had she still had these shares today. Now, Steve took over Jamie's finances, cashing all of her assets, displayed other suspicious behavior, including cleaning the carpet at their home, which appeared to have a large red stain, according to her sister. To his sister, a friend reported seeing a shovel in Steve's truck on the day of Jamie's disappearance. A very odd item that nobody had ever seen him bring with him before. While investigators lacked formal evidence to charge Steve in connection with Jamie's case for several years, they learned about his troubled history including prior criminal charges, substance abuse, and controlling behavior during their marriage. Jamie's loved ones noticed a significant change in her behavior after marrying Stephen, and she started to have an affair with one of his friends at the time of her disappearance. Now, Stephen used multiple aliases and had a criminal record, as well as other identities, such as Stephen Michaels, being the most commonly used of his aliases. 
He was eventually arrested in 2000 and found guilty of Jamie's presumed murder. He was sentenced to 60 years in prison. However, to this day, he to this day he still maintains his innocence. Now, despite these developments, Jamie's whereabouts remain unknown, and foul play is strongly suspected in her case. Writer Anne Rule included her case in her 2000 book, Empty Promises and Other True Cases. Mary Little, a secretary at CNS Bank in Atlanta, Georgia, mysteriously vanished in 1965. Six weeks prior, she married Roy Little, a bank examiner, and was planning a party to welcome him back after his training. On the evening of her disappearance, Mary purchased groceries and had dinner with a co-worker at Lenox Square Shopping Center in Atlanta's Buckhead neighborhood. She appeared cheerful and talked about her married life. However, after dinner, she was never seen again. Mary didn't show up for work the following day, and her absence raised concerns. Her co-worker who dined with her knew, th knew that her car, a metallic pearl gray 1965 Mercury Comet, was parked in a nearby parking lot. Eventually the car was found in plain sight, but covered in red dust, suggesting it had been driven on a dirt road. Inside the car were groceries, coke bottles, and cigarettes. Notably, some of Mary's undergarments were neatly folded on the console, while her bra and the stocking were on the floor with the stocking showing signs of being cut with a knife. Her outer clothes, purse, coat, jewelry, and car keys were missing, along with a phone and guitar. Bloodstains were found in the car, but only a small amount were identified as Mary's. Some officers suspected the scene had been staged due to the excessive smearing of the limited blood. Investigators also discovered an unidentified fingerprint in the blood on the steering wheel. Further puzzling the case, Mary's credit card was used twice in North Carolina on October the 15th, the day after her disappearance. Witnesses at the gas station are called a blood-stained woman traveling with one or two middle-aged men who seem to be controlling her. The credit card slip signed Mrs. Roy Little Jr. and appeared to be in Mary's handwriting. Investigators estimated that her car had been driven 41 unaccounted miles. The license plate on Mary's car was found to be stolen Charlotte, North Carolina plate, raising questions about why the car wasn't discovered earlier at the Lenox Square. A $20,000 ransom demand was made, but turned out to be a hoax. While Roy was considered a person of interest due to their rocky relationship, he had a solid alibi and no motive. Police also investigated a sex scandal at Mary's workplace, but found no connection to her disappearance. Mary had received unsettling phone calls and mysterious flowers, but kept these details to herself. She had also expressed fear about being alone and driving alone shortly before her disappearance. Mary's case remains unsolved, with some believing she staged her own disappearance, while others suspect she was kidnapped. Another woman from the same office, Diane Shields, was killed in 1967, leading to theories of a connection, but this was eventually dismissed. Mary's police file vanished as well, adding further mystery to her disappearance. Once again, as I said already, and as of 2024, her case still remains active and unresolved. The disappearance of Joan Hansen in 1962 is an old but popular story in the annals of true crime. On August the 10th of 1962, Joan was preparing to meet with her sisters at the World's Fair in Seattle, Washington. However, she never arrived at her attended destination and vanished very shortly after. The last known contact with Joan was a phone call she made to her friend Patricia Martin, which took a chilling turn. While speaking with Martin, Joan suddenly screamed, Oh my God, he's in the basement. 
He's coming, she screamed. The call then disconnected abruptly. Concerned, Martin made multiple attempts to reach Joan, but got no response. After several phone calls, Joan's ex-husband, Robert Milton Hansen, answered the phone instead of Joan. When asked about Joan's whereabouts, Robert said, she's with you. However, Joan never returned, and all her belongings were left behind except for a blue sequin dress, one of her favorites. Her Chevy Biscayne was discovered abandoned weeks after her disappearance in Queen Anne Hill neighborhood of Seattle. The car's windows were down, the tires were flat, and the interior was in, a com- was in complete disarray, filled with debris like empty bottles, food wrappers, and cigarette butts. This was very odd because, Jan- because Joan typically maintained the car very clean and very organized. Despite extensive efforts, no usable fingerprints, signs of foul play, or indications of Joan's whereabouts were found. Joan's disappearance occurred in the midst of a divorce from Robert. Their marriage had been marked with a history of physical abuse, with Robert severely beating Joan's eldest son and was very controlling of her. The children were afraid of him, and Joan had even been hospitalized for emotional issues caused by the stress in her life. In May of 1962, Joan moved in with Patricia Martin and started the divorce proceeding, citing abuse. She obtained a restraining order from Robert on August the 8th of 1962, requiring him to vacate the premises. However, just two days later, Joan went missing. Robert reported her disappearance on August the 15th. Joan's attorney proceeded with the divorce case in her, in her absence, and on November the 21st, the divorce was granted. Robert contested the divorce and denies the abuse allegations. And he, he accused Joan of theft and sought to keep, and saying that she really wanted to keep him from his property and assets. However, nonetheless, the judge ruled in favor of Joan, stating that there was sufficient evidence to support the abuse claims. Joan was awarded 40% of the marital property, while Robert received 60%. The court ordered that if Joan did not return alive, her share would be held in trust to the children until they reached the age of an adult. Despite this court order, however, Joan's share of the property eventually fell under Robert's control, leaving the children with nothing. Joan would never use her social security number again after her disappearance, and there was no paper trail. In 1975, she was declared legally dead. Robert, despite being suspected by the police and his sons, was never charged in connection with with Joan's disappearance. Robert Hansen continued to have encounters with the law, including allegations of assaulting people and destroying property. He even advertised for a book for a housekeeper and held a woman against her will on his property. In his later years, he traveled between Washington and Costa Rica, where he married and divorced multiple times. He was denied Costa Rican citizenship and eventually returned to the United States. Joan's children grew up believing that she'd abandoned them. Sadly, her daughter succumbed to drug addiction and passed away sometime in the 80s. The two sons now strongly believe that their father murdered their mother. However, there there has been no resolution in the case and it remains unsolved. Intriguingly, rumors persisted for years that Joan's body may have been buried beneath a barn on a farm in Kent Valley, where the Hansen family once owned property. Despite efforts to investigate this lead, including the use of ground-penetrating perpetrating ra- radar, no evidence has ever been found. Joan's disappearance continues to haunt as it still remains an unresolved mystery. Anne Rule featured the case in her book, Don't Look Behind You, in other cases in 2009.
1994, Jody Brandt, a resident of Lawrenceville, Georgia, embarked on a trip to her cousin's home in Pontiac, Michigan. She set out alone driving her 1987 Ford Escort. On May the 28th of 1994, during this trip, Jody made a call to her cousin, expressing she believed she was in Erie, Ohio, and lost. However, investigators believe she may have been either in Toledo or Erie, Michigan at the time. Later that day, Jody left a message on a friend's answering machine, claiming she had safely arrived in Pontiac. Unfortunately, this would be the last contact anyone had with her. Investigators suspect she may have been coerced into making the call to the friend's answering machine. The situation took a grim turn when Jody's vehicle was found abandoned and burned along a rural road on Turk and Concier in, in Ottawa Lake, Michigan, close to Interstate 75, two miles north of Toledo, Ohio, at 7 a.m. on May the 29th, 1994. The fire was determined to be an intentional act, starting at the front seat of the car after 10 p.m. the prior night. Jody's suitcases were severely damaged in the fire. However, they remained inside the vehicle. The keys were in the ignition. Strangely, the driver's seat had been adjusted all the way back, while Jody typically drove with the seat pushed forward. There was also an unexplained dent in the car's back fender. Despite extensive search efforts involving dogs and helicopter, no trace of Jody was found at the scene. Jody's home life was marked by turmoil as her mother grappled with addiction issues. She dropped out of high school and worked at a fast food restaurant, using her earrings to purchase a car. A few days before her disappearance, Jody had transported 10 pounds of marijuana from Georgia to Michigan with two male friends, earning a substantial amount of money for her involvement. Her last trip, however, was solely intended to visit relatives in Michigan, not for drug activity. It remains unclear whether this activity played a role in her disappearance. To this date, no suspects or persons of interest have been identified in her case, as it remains unsolved. The case of Garmin Sean Cunningham and his alleged involvement in the disappearance of his grandmother is a chilling and tragic case. It all began when a woman managed to escape from the clutches of her husband, Garmin, in November of 2021. She called 911 from a residence on Greenmont Drive, reporting that Cunningham had been holding her against her will since November the 1st. The woman had signs of abuse all over her body from head injuries to open sores and healing burns which she claimed were inflicted on her from her husband during her captivity. According to her account, Cunningham had subjected her to a series of abuse. He beat her, cut her with knives and broken glass, burned her with cigarettes, choked her multiple times, threatened her with a gun, and kept her handcuffed to a chair. She was deprived of basic necessities, such as food and sleep, and even forced to drink WD-40. When the police arrived at the scene, Cunningham barricaded himself into the house, leading to a 30-minute standoff. During this time, officers heard gunshots, the sound of shattered windows, and heavy objects being moved within the residence. Eventually, Cunningham emerged from the house armed with a sword, but he was apprehended by a police dog. During the investigation, it came to light that Cunningham's grandmother, Carlson, had been living with him and his wife. Cunningham's wife revealed that on the, November the 1st, he had brutally assaulted Carlson, attempting to smother her and beat her with his bare fists. She claimed to have witnessed Carlson's head injuries and detailed how Cunningham had thrown his grandmother down a flight of stairs, choked her, and even stabbed her. Shocking as it may sound, while Cunningham realized that his grandmother was still alive, he repeated this vicious cycle, throwing her down the stairs once again, and ultimately carrying her to the garage. 
According to Cunningham's wife, he wrapped Carlson's body in tape and plastic before disposing of it on a mountain, rolling it down an incline to conceal it from view. Forensic searches of the house uncovered compelling evidence corroborating the wife's account. Bloodstains were found in various locations within the residence, including the base of the stairs, the laundry room, and garage. There were signs of an attempt to clean up these bloodstains, and all the carpeting and furniture from Carlson's bedroom had been removed. Additional findings included live rounds and discharged bullet casings scattered throughout the house, along with various weapons, restraints, and other items. Notably, a dumpster delivered to Cunningham's home was found to contain items covered in blood, matching Carlson's DNA, including a broken walker, bedding, clothing, carpeting, cleaning supplies, and a shower curtain. Garmin Sean Cunningham was charged with aggravated murder, aggravated kidnapping, obstructing justice, aggravated assault, and illegal discharge of a firearm. He was awaiting trial for these offenses when, on March of 2022, he took his own life in police custody. As of now, Carlson's remains have never been recovered. Authorities suspect that her grandson disposed of her body in a uh, national forest near State Route 150 Mirror Lake Highway or Route 35. Additionally, electronic evidence from Cunningham's phone indicates that he may have left a black plastic bag which could possibly contain evidence in the Cam in the Camas, Utah area. Don't get mad if I misspelled that Camas Camas. Due to the f- horrifying circumstances surrounding her disappearance, foul play is suspected. Timothy Boone's disappearance in August of 2021 is an interesting one. He went missing along with side his beloved dog, Lily, a brindle pit bull with distinctive blaze on her chest, as well as his brother's dog, Cooper. The events leading to Boone's disappearance began on August the 3rd, when his van became stuck in the San Rafael Swell area. A compassionate couple picked him up and Lily up, but Boone was in a severely dehydrated state. Concerned for his well-being, the couple took him to a fire station, where a medic checked on his vitals to ensure he didn't require medical attention. Strangely, Boone left behind most of his belongings in his van, including his wallet. Local authorities became involved in when Boone's family reported his concerning mental state and disappearance. A police officer arranged for Boone to stay at a hotel in Huntington, Utah, given his lack of funds. However, during that night, or early on August the 4th, Boone left the hotel and made a stop at a nearby convenience store where an employee provided water for Lily. In a series of weird events, Boone stole a garbage truck, drove it to Carbon County, Utah, and abandoned it and proceeded to steal a Jeep Renegade. He attempted to purchase a phone at a cell phone store in Mobe, Utah, but due to his lack of money and ID, he was unsuccessful and had a confrontation with another individual. Subsequently, he stole water in Thompson Springs, Utah, before abandoning the stolen Jeep at Interstate 70's mile marker at 221 in Cisco, Utah. After these events, Boone's whereabouts have now become uncertain. There were potential sightings of him in Nuckley, Colorado, and Telluride, Colorado areas later that same month. Three weeks after his disappearance, Cooper, his brother's dog, was discovered alive and alone in Emory County, Utah, but there was no sign of Boone or Lily. In May of 2023, a hiker found Boone's guitar, backpack, and poncho in a remote deserted area on San Rafael Swell, approximately 30 miles from where Cooper had been found. About a week later, the same hiker discovered more of Boone's belongings, including his watch and phone, located about 300 feet from the initial discovery. 
These items seemed weathered and sun-bleached, indicating they had been there for an extended period of time. Despite these findings, no further trace of Boone or Lily has ever been located. Boone had a prior conviction for arson stemming from a 2018 incident during a manic episode. He'd been, a psych- He'd been in a psychotic state and had set fire in attempting to send a signal to his daughter in Australia. Following this, he spent six months in jail and was subsequently released on probation with an order to complete mental, a mental health evaluation and treatment program. Boone's sister believes he left the hotel on August the 3rd after overhearing the police officer who paid for the room, speaking with his probation officer. Reportedly, he was not in violation of probation at the time of his disappearance. His probation was set on to end on August the 6th, after which he would, he could have just, you know, had it expunged from his record. Now, with all this said, the circumstances surrounding Timothy Boone's disappearance really remain unclear, but due to his history of mental health issues, adds complexity to this case and possibly amplifies his risk. To this day, his case remains unresolved, leaving many unanswered questions. 